Before we get going, I wanted to welcome you to another ad-free Pretty Much Pop episode, meaning that we're relying on your support to allow sweet, sweet discussions like the one you're about to hear to happen. So please visit patreon.com slash pretty much pop, where even a low, low $1 a month pledge gets you access to bonus discussion for nearly every single episode, which on at least some occasions is honestly better than what you're going to actually hear during the public discussion. So check it out, patreon.com slash pretty much pop. Thanks. This is Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast today talking about the hero's journey in films as it's been evolving with the rise of female action heroes. I'm Mark Linsenmeyer, entering the podcast with three backflips and a manly pirouette. I'm Erica Spires, ceaselessly trying to bridge the gap between my femininity and masculinity. And I'm Brian Hurt. And as someone who identifies with the sidekicks more than the heroes, I am still waiting for that podcast. And Vi, who are you? I am Vi Berlue currently pursuing my career as an Amazon warrior. Mm. Welcome by. <laughs> Welcome. This was a topic you had suggested to us or someone had suggested on your behalf because you'd written in this area. I guess maybe as a, a little background, your research was rising out of the whole idea of what is the book by Joseph Campbell? Hero with a Thousand Faces. Yes, which has often been was brought into pop culture really by George Lucas in talking about how that sculpted the plot of Star Wars, that there's sort of these paradigmatic stages in the hero's journey. You know, if you look at ancient Greek myths and things like that. Yeah, why don't you give us a little where you're coming into with that? Using George Lucas's jumping off point with Star Wars, seems like every major modern pop culture film past that point kind of used that same formula, playing off of the success of Star Wars and the timelessness of the hero myth. But what interests me is how that myth has evolved and changed when our expectations for our characters change. So specifically, I look at how gender plays a role in redefining this age-old, timeless, kind of placeless myth that's touched every culture around the world. I think we are in an interesting time period now where we get to alter the myth a little and make it better suited for our storytelling and our characters. In writing, there's this discussion of how many stories there really even are. And it becomes this reductive exercise. And someone will say, well, there's really only 15 different stories. Boy loses girl, boy does on a quest, gets girl, or something bad happens and then good and then neutral and then twist, whatever. And then you get down to, well, there's really only five kinds of stories. And then you get down to the fact that, well, there's really only one story. And that story, usually the joke is that it's Beowulf. Or that the story is something happens or something different happens. But I'm always drawn to these discussions where, you know, I think reductivism is, is useful and a way to look at a lot of different things. You try to look at it through the same lens and see how they are similar or are different. I, my question would be to you, Vita, to start, which is you know, how compelling do you find some of these arguments? If we start examining everything since Star Wars, as you say, would we find thousands of counterexamples? Or is there some authenticity to that argument that we are really kind of seeing the same thing over and over again? I think there's a, a lot of authenticity to it if you are malleable with your hero myth. That's like a, a yes and a no answer. <laughs> but most of our stories, if they feel like they aren't just the hero myth if we don't reduce them down to that one story. What we can do instead is we can say that they are pieces of the hero myth, chopped up, displayed differently, but that they do all center around this same cycle, the same concept. So I think there's a lot of validity to that. And it's important to trace our stories through the hero myth because it's so compelling and it makes for a good story. We keep coming back to it because we enjoy it. So I think it's all right if we tell the same story a couple of different ways. Could you give us like the basics of the hero's journey? And then maybe we can talk about the basics of the heroine's journey. Absolutely. So the hero myth, Joseph Campbell traces as the story that defines the journey of a protagonist across cultures and across time. It begins, if we were looking at Star Wars, for example, with our protagonist hearing that call to adventure, be Luke, seeing the hologram, Leia's message, 
moves on to refusing the call. That can be either a refusal from the protagonist who doesn't want to leave what they call their ordinary world, or someone on behalf of the protagonist saying, no, you can't go, it's too dangerous. That would be Uncle Owen. Meeting a mentor is the next step where a hero is going to encounter a wise old man figure, Obi-Wan Kenobi, for example, who's going to push them forward on their journey to leave their known world. And once they've exited the known world, they're going to face trials, they're going to face allies and enemies that are ultimately going to lead them to some kind of self-discovery. On the course of this self-discovery, they're going to hit what's called the bottom of the barrel. They bottom out, everything looks hopeless, there's no going forward, but if the hero is able to overcome that feeling, they earn their reward, their elixir to take back home and pass that lesson on. So for Luke, that would be learning the force, using the force, going on to use that as part of the rest of his journey. So that is the basic outline of the myth that Campbell traces through all kinds of stories all throughout history and all throughout various time periods, which is really interesting that despite how different cultures can be, despite who we consider to be heroes, almost every story follows this basic pattern. Boy, uh, spoiler alert for Star Wars. Jeez, now now I'm not going to watch this movie. I was so excited. All right, go on. (laughs) There can be anywhere from like 37 to 13 different steps to the hero's journey, depending on like how you cycle it out. But 13 is like the basic hit all the numbers. Disney can do that. Kids can learn about it. Those are all the good ones. And sorry for the Star Wars spoilers. I'll keep them to a minimum. Now, are we saying that what you were seeing to be getting at, Brian, with talking about reductionism is this the structure of story itself, sort of narrative itself, which is a weird way of talking about it because <laughs> it seems like you could have any string of happenings that would go together, but does it make a narrative? Like what distinguishes from a narrative from just an account of things that happen in somebody's life? It seems like we have to be pointing at something that is psychological, right? something that is satisfying in a particular way. And so even though this was something that Joseph Campbell was saying, like there's got to be some reason why this pattern repeats in so many ancient mythical tales. And then Lucas was saying, I'm going to consciously do that. People in the old times that they might have been, you can ask why they were kept repeating that. It could be because they were influenced by each other. But I think Campbell was saying that there's something psychologically basic about this general pattern. But in that case, if that was really the case, then like you wouldn't have to consciously pursue it because we'd already see pre-Star Wars, if we just did a survey of movies from 1950, we should see just as many films that follow that basic structure. But I'm guessing from what you're saying, Vi, that you don't think that's actually the case, that it was something that sort of caught on more with this conscious adoption. Can you explain that at all? The conscious adoption of this story links to that psychological element that When we purposefully tell this story, not on accident, not by happenstance, but when we directly tell the story, it becomes more compelling. So films before Star Wars, I'm sure you can go back and you can find heroes, anti-heroes, pillars of storytelling. Of course you can. But with Star Wars, a conscious decision to follow this pattern leads to the biggest explosion of fandom and of relationships to these characters that I think you see in modern times. So there's something to be said for the I relate to this psychological element that Lucas pushes forward with the storytelling and that giant companies searching for the next blockbuster latch on to then. Oh, I want to make something that people can relate to. The easiest, most sure found way to do that then is by telling a hero story. We all want to see ourselves as the hero. What better way to do it than to plug us into a hero myth? But are they really latching on to the hero myth or just onto Star Wars? Right? Does that become the new Ur myth that everyone is just rebuilding? And they're not going as far back as Campbell or as far back as the ancient Greeks. That's the new normal that everyone's just trying to reinterpret. And I'm being a bit of a gadfly by asking, but I also know that some people are just telling stories that resonate with them and aren't doing maybe the homework that George Lucas was doing. Lord of the Rings, though. The Hobbit. I mean, those were things that came before. And sure, they weren't in the time of filmmaking, but like in terms of the types of stories they were and the books that you could read, they were huge. 
and continue to be huge today. And I think, you know, that would support it's the hero's journey thing. I think also we talked about during Christmas time, we talked a lot about Ebenezer Scrooge and how we keep seeing a Christmas carol coming back and that idea of different sorts of types of Christmas carol mythologies coming back and forth. And that is another form of hero's journey as well. I suppose Tolkien was moderately educated. I guess that's the the thing, right? Is that the success of Star Wars and things after it maybe embolden other filmmakers to say, well, here's something that I think maybe couldn't be made before that now we could take a shot at. If we continue to look at Star Wars and we look at the more recent films, how does Ray's story relate to the hero's journey or does it more closely relate to a heroine's journey and what's the difference? Full disclosure, absolutely love Ray. What an awesome way to approach the narrative. Ah, oh, so good. <laughs> Wait, there's more Star Wars? Surprise. <laughs> she is interesting because now we can have this conversation about what it is to be a female character embarking on a masculine hero's journey. So there are two different cycles. There's the hero's journey, which we went over, and then the heroine's journey, which feminist theorists have plotted out to be something different in terms of what the characters are experiencing. But they're not gender exclusive. So very often you will see female characters in a protagonist role that follow the masculine hero's journey. And it's totally vice versa as well. You'll see male characters follow a heroine's journey through their respective stories. Ray follows a pretty cyclical, pretty well plotted out hero's journey, especially if you take the whole saga, the whole sequel trilogy into account. The last film does a really good job of hitting home some of those uh, a little more Freudian ideas from the hero's myth, uh, atonement with the father and really hitting that bottom of the barrel without too many spoilers. <laughs> but Ray gives us the opportunity to examine what parts of the myth are masculine and what parts of the myth are feminine and how do female characters challenge those preconceptions. Spoil away to examine that in detail. Definitely. Don't worry about that. Yeah. So if she meets up with her grandfather, Palpatine, she is atoning with her father figure, the only father figure that the series permanently allows her. We go through Han Solo and we go through Luke as mentor figures, but we meet the father. The parentage was such a big deal for that character. So then we get to ask, well, usually this is a big deal because it's a male character meeting his father figure. And with Freud's influence over the hero myth, that would be very problematic. There's some butting heads there. But Ray isn't a man. So how does she deal with atoning with a masculine figure? What parts of herself are called into question? What do we see her masculinity as? It becomes really interesting. And Ray's not the only character that, that gets to play with these ideas. There are a lot of new stories that are coming out that are, are poking at this masculine, feminine, hero, heroine dichotomy and saying, well, wait a minute, what about us? What do we have to offer that's new? Why do we have to be confined to this box? So if we look at one of the articles that we've looked at today is The Heroine Journeys Project. And this is about Wonder Woman, written by Savannah Jackson. Now, she talks about how Wonder Woman is on a hero's journey. And please correct me at any point if I'm wrong, because I get very confused about the specifics between the different waves of feminism. And that like then also makes me confused about, is this a heroine's journey part? Is this a hero's journey part? I'm a little confused. So we have Wonder Woman, who basically rejects what her mother says and becomes a warrior to fight and defeat Ares, right? So she is, in essence, like on the hero's journey is what they're saying, right? Because she like defies that parental figure and doubles down on the warrior stance. But then we have Rey, who likewise is on a hero's journey, question mark, who gets to see Palpatine. And is she being like Palpatine? in fighting against him or is she directly going against him and that's what creates the fight that makes her fight for her life in the end so it'd be more of a heroine spin on it or you see what I'm doing like I'm just like getting myself into like I'm a ball of yarn all twisted up right now can you compare a little bit of like about those two stories and what the differences would be in those endings 
Wonder Woman is very interesting because she is reconciling with what parts of herself kind of get to fit that warrior position that she has. Does she fight for the good of all mankind? What does love have to do with her battles? So she is definitely on a hero's journey. Her bottom of the barrel is realizing all of mankind may not be good, but I'm going to fight for them anyways. And that's what brings her back up is her love for everyone. So that's what she returns with as her elixir. Ray has a somewhat more isolated return with the elixir because it's so internal. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a heroine's journey, but rather that her hero's journey is a little more self reflective. Not that Diana's isn't. She's still grappling with her own personality and her desires. But Ray, when she bottoms out with her grandfather in Exegol, she's grappling with her own identity. Whereas Diana seems to be grappling with her place in the world. And now they're not mutually exclusive. They are one in the same. You must have a self-identity in order to find your place in society. But they're both on a hero's journey. Just how far out the lens goes in terms of who they are and what they're fighting for. That, to me, seems to be the main difference between the two of them. But it doesn't separate them from the hero myth, necessarily. I was wondering about about the starting point and the fact that different characters, even if you've got various action movies with action heroes, some of them are kind of ordinary people who are grabbed out of by circumstances, you know, like uh, in the Terminator, the Sarah Connor character, just an absolutely ordinary person. And circumstances make it such that three movies later, she's, or even two movies later, she's a badass, full on hero type with no particular, I mean, that is the journey. There really is no, there's no end to it. It can just keep going over film after film, apparently. In fact, I just saw Roadhouse <laughs> over the weekend, which has another kind of, I'm a badass from the very beginning. I'm a lone cowboy, mysterious badass. Any number of cowboy movies would have this kind of same thing, which it's definitely not starting with. In fact, you probably have to have some other character be the audience stand in meeting the mysterious badass hero who then is going to figure out. It seems maybe that's mixing things together in terms of, is the audience standing? Maybe that's the person who's going on the journey and meeting this mentor, but taking something like a Clint Eastwood cowboy movie or Roadhouse as one of the hero movie types, then you could just have somebody who starts off as a badass, faces challenges. Maybe there's some self-revelation or something. Maybe there's some resolution. If it's a 70s film, probably everybody just dies. But uh, is that just... The lens is zoomed in, in a way, that we're not getting the origin story, we're not getting, but it still can be taken as part of the same long journey. I think you could absolutely find that the audience will relate to any character, and and regardless of where your lens is, you still have the potential for heroes. Like Sarah Connor, we can continue to expand the story, and when we expand the story, you know, we add in more material, we give them new trials. And when we do that, we can find more of the hero in them. Now with some of the like the Clint Eastwood movies, it's hard because like you said, they're just a badass. And we as the audience must assume that we are not as badass as that guy. But with self-realization and a small completion of the cycle, even if we don't necessarily start with an ordinary world or a hyper-relatable character... Seeing someone come out of the bottom of the cycle and still recognizing that there's something to learn, that audiences can latch onto. The lens may be so zoomed in that we're missing some of the more down home, this is what my life is like too part, but we all have something to learn. And that's what the end of the cycle should be, is is coming back with the elixir that's taught us something and that we're going to pass on to other people. So I, I think you still have room to be relatable, even when the lens gets so close that your face is pressed up against it. I don't want to push too hard, Vi, but could you specifically address Roadhouse? (laughs) (laughs) Roadhouse. No one must do that. (laughs) (laughs) Would it disappoint you to know that I wasn't born when Roadhouse came out? (laughs) It would bum me out a little bit. (laughs) 
I was just reading through this Wikipedia article that details the heroine's journey, and I was reading it out loud to my husband on the phone. Let me just hit the main points because this is, I'll tell you what he says. This is the Maureen Murdoch, The Heroine's Journey, Woman's Quest for Wholesomeness. Okay. So the shift from feminine to masculine. So she begins to distance herself from anything deemed feminine. Then there's an identification with the masculine. I'm going through it very quickly, but here's the idea. Then there's the road of trials, experiencing the illusory boon of success. Now, this is what it says underneath that. The heroine will overcome the obstacles that she faced. This is usually where the hero's journey ends. Upon experiencing success, the heroine will now realize she has betrayed her own values in order to achieve the goal. The heroine will feel limited in her new life. She has achieved everything she set out to do, but it has come to great sacrifice to her soul. I read this out loud to my husband and he goes, well, that kind of stinks. <laughs> and I was like, this is exactly how I feel <laughs> when I achieve something, you know, like, because there is this, and I'm not saying that it, this is exclusive to the feminine experience, but I think maybe this is something they're hitting on here is there is a difference in just going back in the cycle after you get your elixir, right? And instead you get the elixir, but it comes at a cost that you may have not expected. And so it makes you look back. So what then happens here is there's a descent meeting with the goddess, the yearning to reconnect and reconciliation with the masculine, and eventually the union of the two selves. I know I'm going through all that too quickly right now, but we can get into a little bit more of it if we want to here in this next part of the discussion. But I think what's interesting here is it seems to be it doesn't end at the elixir and the homecoming. There is something gained and something lost and something that has to then be reconciled a thesis, an antithesis, and then a synthesis at the end. And is that particular to the heroine's journey as it is spelled out here, as opposed to the heroes? I think when we see the heroine's journey, if we're going to compare it directly to the masculine hero's journey, this is specific to the heroine's journey. The closest that we probably get to this cycle in the hero's journey is actually when we write anti-heroes, when they don't get to come back with the elixir, they kind of reach that descent and the yearning, but they don't get to circle back up and, and have any kind of reconciliation. So it is unique to the heroine, only because when we tend to tell it in the masculine form, we don't come all the way back. We bottom out, we stop, and it gives us characters like uh, Severus Snape, who we want them to reconcile and to come back and to be better, but they don't get the chance to. Wow, that's kind of tragic. We could throw Tragic Hero in here too if we're really feeling. <laughs> what I tried to do with this description of the heroine's journey was disconnect it from the sort of traditional male female, but still look at this journey as a hero, I guess either gender or, or whatever, who is stepping away from their natural state in a way and then having to reconcile with it. So kind of going to this other and then having that illusory boon, having to reconcile that they've kind of gotten away from whatever their traditional or natural state is. What, what occurred to me was Frodo and he really steps away from being a hobbit and goes on a man's journey, but then he has to reconcile with being a hobbit again. That's not perfect, but for us to allow the fact that a man or woman can go on a hero's or heroine's journey does require, I think, a little bit of lateral thinking, or at least allowing ourselves to not be too strict with these terms so that we can apply it a little bit more broadly. Kylo Ren, would Kylo Ren be an example of somebody who actually, well, he'd be another Severus, I suppose, right? Because we see that he's going to maybe achieve this at the end of the last movie, and then his journey's over. Right, he never gets to come back with anything to teach. He's done. I think you had it exactly right, Vi, with the anti-hero, because it's so easy for good and bad to be those things that one is, is struggling against or going through it in one direction and then have to reconcile it back onto the other side of that good and evil spectrum. I would have loved it if he would have survived and we would have seen how he had to reconcile all that in either another movie or at the end of that film and see how people react to him and how he has to become a leader in spite of all of the hurt and pain he has caused his people. So I wonder if Murdoch's particular take on the heroine's journey is not tied to the idea that this whole thing is happening under some kind of patriarchy, that the shift from feminine to masculine is 
you know, somebody like Joe in Little Women who's, you know, shaking out of the role that they've been assigned and then doing these hero journey kind of things. And then at the end, this whole yearning to reconnect, realizing that you've kind of betrayed yourself. I think this is at least if the storyteller's point of view is that no, actually the woman's place is at least in part in that traditional role, then that storyteller would think that, okay, then if she's basically done all these male things, then she should kind of feel a little weird about that by the end and feel that she has to reconnect with her femininity and get some sort of peace between these things. Whereas if you just reject that, you know, straight jacket system altogether, then what you probably wouldn't think that psychologically, you know, she'd probably be perfectly happy <laughs> having broken out of what has been expected from her, the equivalent of her being a moisture farmer or, uh, getting married or whatever the thing is you're supposed to do in that society. It's the Mulan paradox, right? Like you said, you go off, you do amazing things and you come back and she's home with her dad. They have a sword now, but she's home with a man, nevertheless. But if we ask the heroine to reconcile with the parts of herself that she's rejected, the next step would be to ask the hero to reconcile with the feminine. And to bring that back. And I think that's where some of the dichotomy comes in. The heroine's journey has this union at the end. The hero's journey often doesn't. But when we plug in female characters, now we're asking the hero's journey to rewrite itself. Be more flexible. Find that union again. Because right now it doesn't necessarily exist unless that is the part of the story that the hero needed to learn, unless that's explicitly what you're out to get. But if we can rewrite the cycle to make it an integral step, a step that you must take before you get the elixir, that would create, I think, some pretty compelling stories. And I think we're starting to get there in some of our films. Should we talk about Harry Potter? <laughs> One of these articles, Is There a Heron's Journey by Roseanne Welsh at Medium, was saying, then maybe Harry Potter is actually doing the female hero's journey, which I didn't think about that in detail. Is there a yearning for reconnection and union and all that stuff at the end of that? It seems as though there would be. At least the movies make it somewhat explicit with the scene in the second part of Deathly Hallows as you see Voldemort and Harry's faces do that thing. <laughs> they become the same face. If that is Harry's part of himself that he's missing... There is a union there, although there is also a defeat of that side. There is one last rejection. It'd be an interesting one to plot out. I think it has elements of both. It definitely has that yearning to be a whole person again. And he gets what he wants, only to yearn to come back to life right after Voldemort kills him. So I, th I think there's a compelling argument there. And then likewise, another one of the articles, This is the Toxic Myth at the Heart of Female Movie Reboots by Emily Spires. The conversation was basically saying that if you was looking at something like Wonder Woman and saying, actually, no, just putting, especially if it's just a, let's retell a story that had a male lead and just throw in a woman and don't change it at all. That's the kind of bad feminism from Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, where you just say, hey, woman, just act like a man just you know so in other words the only change would be this shift from feminine to masculine and then everything proceeds from there so it seems like you get feminist critiques either if you ignore sort of the patriarchy and like i said once she's doing masculine things that's fine <laughs> just let her stay that way like that seems like very empowering but you could also say no no, no that's actually sexist that's ignoring the differences the you know the positive contribution that being a woman could have to this story it's really interesting. This article got my attention very quickly. <laughs> this idea that we would be masculizing the feminine, to me, feels so stuck in the binary. When we masculize the feminine, is that not just an expansion of what we accept to be feminine? And can it not do the work in reverse to feminize the masculine until we've chipped down both sides and now we have just a hero who doesn't necessarily need to be one or the other. Of course, like you said, you'd get flack <laughs> kind of either way you, you play that. But when you do away with that binary, 
are you not just telling stories about people? They don't have to be hyper masculine or hyper feminine. They just get to be relatable to whatever parts you see in them that you see in yourself. That would be the ultimate story. So this, this idea of somehow we're doing feminism a disservice by plugging in characters like Wonder Woman who are very masculine or Captain Marvel who for years was a, a male character and then only kind of recently got to be a woman. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think it starts to break down our preconceptions of storytelling in a way that can benefit both masculine and feminine sides. However you want to connect to that character, it's open to you now. You don't have to be one or the other. That whole argument in that article concedes kicking ass and not looking back as masculine traits. And I don't really know that that's something that I'm comfortable with. Captain Marvel is such an interesting example because I I don't know the whole history. If, If this was something that happened in the comic books and then happened in the movies as well, that he was reimagined as a she or kind of how, how that all happened. I think it was in the comic books. Okay. First. Like back to the seventies. Yeah. There was okay. still a- the idea of just taking a man's story and making it a woman's story without really changing it much. There's a, at the time that we're recording this podcast, just a few days ago, there was a bit of a controversy. Actually, there was a big controversy about Barnes and Noble changing the cover of classic books and making the characters people of color and a large community of people really finding this to be tokenistic and disgusting. You just can't make Dorothy brown skinned. And how is that helping authors, right? This is not a way to be racially diverse and culturally sensitive. It's just shorthand tokenism. And I do see the point of that argument, but I don't feel like Wonder Woman is could be a man's story at all. I mean, it's a real specific world she comes from, and she has relationships with her society and with females and with males in her society. Well, she goes through the steps of what we've been calling the, the hero's journey or the heroine's journey. We've already established that a, a male or female can do either one of those. I'm really comfortable mansplaining Emily Spears' article. No, no, no. I think it's self-mansplanatory, honestly, (laughs) but I'll do it. I'm really enjoying actually you going through this, and I I really appreciate the care you're taking to try to not offend anybody. Well, I'm trying. I'm just failing. If you're not offended, I'll try harder. I think you're correct on so many of these things. I mean, I, I don't think, I can't speak for all women, but for myself, I don't have any problem going to a movie and watching a man's story. I don't think most women are saying we just need women to be in all of these stories. You know, we just need new stories as well. We don't need to replace Superman with a female character, but having the option to also go see Wonder Woman is awesome now that we can do that. And having some other great options of female superheroes. Captain Marvel was excellent. And then now finally we get this Black Widow story, which I'm interested in seeing. And evidently they wanted to do it years ago and it didn't happen like in sequence. So I think that people are realizing that there are many, not only women, but men who enjoy these stories and that people are going to go buy the ticket. And yeah, you're going to have a few people who are going to be hating on female characters for whatever reason. But I don't, I think mostly there's a lot of men who feel like they like feminine things and a lot of women who like masculine things. Do we feel like this discussion is specific to fantasy sort of settings that in some of the sources we were looking at online, it was talking about, for instance, on Wikipedia, Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte's character as illustrating heroines in their place within the hero's journey. And I mentioned already Joe from Little Women. We don't necessarily have to have a fantasy setting to sketch some of this stuff out. It's just clearer, right? You get to go to not just a larger world, but a completely different world if you're talking about somebody actually going out and seeing all the crazy fantasy things that are presumably unfamiliar to the audience as well as to this this character. It's interesting that that you bring that up because I think part of why some stories are are more compelling than others is because they exceed the normal world. You're talking about Black Widow. Her character for many years was difficult. Like <laughs> she was the the token female and her problems compared to like the whole rest of the Avengers team seemed almost mundane. 
because they were so situated in the ordinary world. We identified more with Captain America and his many alien encounters, despite being from Earth, because that was more interesting than trying to figure out, well, Natasha can't have kids. That wasn't as compelling because it, it was so out of place in that world. But stories that are meant to be in kind of the normal world, Jane Eyre, those kind of romantic era stories, they still have validity to them. I think we're just not quite as drawn to them because they're not fantastic. And watching heroes who deal with our silly everyday problems successfully might, might feel like a kick in the teeth. Oh, well, she figured it out. Now what am I supposed to do? But they're still interesting. They're just not I don't think quite as out there, which makes them less fun. We're, we're looking for adventure when we tell these stories to some extent. Well, that might be how you spice up a mundane story that I think there were references in one of those articles to Dickens as well, that if you can have a character that is the equivalent of a moisture farmer in, in uh, old time England, that then can go out and, and like Nicholas Nickleby and be exposed to this wide world of villains and industry and crazy stuff like that, then you're making something that is, by having this pattern that is sort of like this mythical hero's journey, even if you don't go beyond the mundane in, in any of the things, as long as it's not, where should the kids live after we get divorced? Like, that's not going to be in a hero's journey <laughs> tale. That is too depressing and mundane. That sounds like a very interesting <laughs> story, Mark. I, I can't wait to watch that movie. <laughs> but if it's creating a business empire or a empire of organized crime or something like that, then that's still the kind of great achievement that it sounds like, you know, you could mythologize, you could talk about Henry Ford or George Washington or any of these people that did real things or Harriet Tubman creating the Underground Railroad, you know, that just the idea that we can make everyday occurrences more spectacular by mythologizing them, which might involve, I guess, connecting the dots to the hero's myth. Yeah, it is hard to do it in the regular everyday world, isn't it? I think what stands out the most of stories that do that successfully, you could argue, is, you know, with Dorothy Gale and the Wizard of Oz, that is the real world and she dreams this other land. So you still have a character rooted in reality who goes, you know, in their, on a journey in their own mind. So maybe that's a way to make something both relatable and fantastical and exciting. Dorothy is our ultimate, I want to be her. She gets to do it all. She gets to have the fantasy and the, the real world experience. And that's just what we're doing by consuming this media and watching these movies is we're imagining. And it's like the best part of any film. Hey, I can do that. I want to do that. That, that makes it fun. You're so much smarter than I was at, at your age and <laughs> even now. So this is really like, I, I'm just like, yes, bye, more bye. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is good. This is a podcast. I'm definitely blushing. <laughs> I feel like it isn't too hard to think of more mundane examples of people going on this journey. I mean, I, maybe I'm just kidding myself, but even things that are, are low stakes from the viewer standpoint are still very high stakes as internalized by the person doing it. I'm thinking of the movie Working Girl with Melanie Griffith. I don't know if everyone... If you have seen it, but Bye, I don't know if you've seen it, but it's it's worth a watch. Put it on a list for sure. A woman who is a secretary in New York, and this is in the eighties. It's a contemporary story told in the late eighties, who finds herself in a position to be on an executive track. And it deals with a lot of gender issues that come up throughout the story, even as baked into the title. I think we could map her story out according to the steps of as I look at them more the heroine's journey than the hero's journey. I think what confounds everyday stories a little bit is the romance sometimes as being the goal rather than a stop along the way. And it's not that exciting a thing when it's really the quest, the way that saving the universe is the quest and the stakes are higher and maybe the transient nature of romance, or maybe it's a big deal for the person, but for the rest of us, we're like, eh, you know, this is your happiness. It's not my happiness. I don't know why it doesn't work at quite the same level. So that maybe would be more an argument in that direction of why these mundane stories don't work quite as well. I'm sure we can map it out there. We're also though talking about something that hopefully has a huge cultural impact though, right? And that's hard for 
a simple movie to have that. I mean, obviously they have, but in terms of people coming back for multiple films in the same series or having a spinoff te- television series or having dolls to go along with it. That just doesn't happen usually with our basic everyday stories. Maybe in a different time, stories that become part of our cultural lexicon. So maybe it doesn't have to be anything more than just a story, but Casablanca being a hero's journey. But you're right, we're not playing with Rick dolls. Right? <laughs> Rick and Ilsa, we're just doing those scenes over and over. Yeah, it just doesn't happen so much. <laughs> I guess I prefer to think more about story logic. And, you know, of course, there's a psychological component to that. Again, otherwise, there would be no such thing as story logic. You have to say what is going to be among the options, what is going to be satisfying. Because as soon as we get the idea that we could add sequel and sequel and sequel <laughs> to something, especially, then we can't be talking about the same hero's journey. The further journeys, especially there's going to be anything actually surprising about the subsequent things that happen. And maybe this is why people didn't like The Last Jedi as much is because it was by making some left turns, it was saying, screw that familiar archetype. We're going to do something that I want to say dialectically makes sense. In other words, it's a variation off of what came before. It's just clearly related to what came before. It's not random. Defying expectations is one of the, in fact, psychologically satisfying ways of you know, moving a story forward, but it wasn't merely repeating that same cycle. This is actually a conversation I just had with my dad. So (laughs) it's very interesting that that The Last Jedi in particular played with our familiar cycle. And I think rather than diverting Luke's story, it expanded. It gave him a second bubble to exist as a hero within. He does his whole original trilogy thing. He's good, comes back with the elixir. We as the audience are informed that he starts a school. He's got a new Jedi temple. That's his return. What The Last Jedi did is it put another bubble on top of that and said, no, he's bottomed out again. He's dealing with all of the ramifications of that return, making his return with the elixir from the original trilogy into his new ordinary world which he then had to leave and has to come back to when we see him as Master Skywalker in the last installment of the saga. So putting bubbles on top of our already completed cycles is a great way to move sequels and move new TV shows along. But to your point, it can frustrate people (laughs) because, oh, this is my hero. He had completed his journey and I, as the viewer, was at peace with that. Now it's more complicated again. But The Last Jedi is my favorite example of a film that does that. And in my opinion, does it well. But I don't want to like get into a fist fight <laughs> with anyone when I leave about The Last Jedi. <laughs> Too late. Oh, no. <laughs> but Mark, I think what you are getting at also is this idea that people, when they like something, they want to see it again. And paradoxically, they don't want to see the exact same thing again. So it's a very hard thing to satisfy. From a narrative standpoint, it's a trick to pull off. And I think this is what you described as putting a, a bubble around something to, to make it part of a bigger thing. You've done a piece of it, but now we have to do it. It really was just a piece of a, a larger journey that's still happening, I, I think, is a way to do it, whether it was done successfully in episode eight. Sure, we'll say it's up for debate. Well, I also wonder if one of those available directions is to kind of think more closely about what the fallout really would be, that what is great about the end of Lord of the Rings is that it really does feel like these hobbits have come back from World War One. This is the intention. And of course, they're not just going to be smiling and happy and we have the boon. Like, of course, there's going to be things to adjust to. And maybe like Frodo, you just can't. You have to move on. Whereas I just rewatched the original Star Wars. And at the end of that, they're just all standing, getting their medals. They're They're so happy. Not like... Well, how many people just died on both sides? Yeah. Where's, you know? where's Not- Leia mourning Alderaan at all through the course of that movie? <laughs> yes. Oh, everybody that I grew up with is dead. My dad is dead. Maybe that, you know, <laughs> it was much more uh, melancholy. Yeah, you could still have the awards ceremony and try to get your spirits up. But like there needs to be some sort of ambivalence at the very least. Well, it spawned all those Thrawn books, right? At the end of 
of Return of the Jedi. It's like, oh, the Emperor's dead. Okay, well, this thing ain't over. That's great, but this is a world we're living in, and that doesn't mean the end of anything. Yes, power vacuum. To me, that always seems, as a person who's not nine years old (laughs) now, that seems like a positive reflection on what would it really have been like, again, for all these superhero movies, making them more and more gritty people, like in Watchmen, dealing with the fact that these characters just like to beat people in the head. (laughs) You're kind of betraying the what makes a myth work as a myth, that there needs to be something sort of simplistic about it and archetypical about it. And you're not reflecting on the realistic psychology that Beowulf or whatever would have going through this, that you need to just have them come out the other side and everybody say, yay. And then you end the story. That's satisfying. Mark, I wonder a little bit whether that wasn't part of the charm of Star Wars in the seventies when we were in this post Watergate, really gritty storytelling Even the happy endings were bummers in the 70s. And so in addition to clicking or checking all the boxes in terms of myth and satisfying these really deep storytelling urges that it was, yeah, it was just really that this, as you call it, simplistic, upbeat and yeah, not realistic. But you know what? One of them is a Muppet. So, I mean, we've already said goodbye to realistic. And R2 can keep getting blown up. And yet they fix him in the next scene. He's like a cartoon. (laughs) They can't fix his flying. (laughs) Don't know why. (laughs) But it does seem like built into this, the heroine's idea of, you know, that you've got these psychological elements, the union, the shift that just introducing that and having to deal with some complexity. Maybe that's why it's not that the archetypical, the simplest possible story, at least according to the way it's been inherited to us, is non-gendered. In other words, male. (laughs) Whereas when you introduce that new element, then there's a certain amount of psychological realism that is almost forced into it just by having to deal with this real-life difference between sexes and not just trying to ignore gender altogether the way a completely male-dominated storytelling world might do. Yeah. And depending on how you tell your story, too, you have room to do both. The new Wonder Woman movie suggests that we will do both. Ends with exactly what the the hero's journey demands, that kind of somewhat simplistic, she's okay, we're good, we go back, but now we have to deal with the fact that she's going to live for a 100 years, all of her friends are going to die, and yet she will go on. How does she feel about humanity? In terms of sequel storytelling... It could be a really interesting way to play with that. You tell your hero's journey first, you complete your cycle. Now what? Is the heroine's journey the immediate next step uh, to ensure that you have a well-rounded, very realistic character? And I think that gets us all the way back to where Mark started with this idea of narrative, right? So we have these journeys and they don't actually make a story on their own. Maybe they're necessary, but they're not sufficient, because you still need, it's the art of storytelling and doing it in a way that is interesting and we still have to care about it. It's just having it isn't enough. But I, I think, Vi, as you kind of put these different configurations forward, I, I can see how that would all be seeds of really something that's potentially awesome, but could also end up failing if it wasn't done With some artistic skill. I think that might be part of the reason that for me, the latest installment showed so much promise and then faltered for me at the end because, you know, you can tell this kind of same story with a different viewpoint, but then they were trying to tell the old one as well as the new one. And it was like, who is the focus of this and whose story is it and whose journey is it? And they were putting so many different types of hero's journey on top of each other, right? So we had Ray's and we still had some of Luke's going on. We still had some of Leia's going on. So maybe it was just messy storytelling. Thanks for clarifying. You didn't actually say what you were talking about there, Erica. So I assumed you were talking about Roadhouse. So (laughs) I apologize. I also have not seen Roadhouse. Oh, man. All right. Well, the Roadhouse podcast is going to have to wait. So I can't wait until we, instead of having this evolution toward more psychological realism and even trying to stuff all the the cartoon characters, the comic book characters into, you know, realistically human narratives, that we have Adventure, the movie based on the Atari game, just to reference something else that was before Vi was born and probably before (laughs) Eric. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> that where you're, where you're merely a block and you, you wander around and when you find a, a sword, it's an arrow. You bump into, and then you just kind of try to run into the dragon enough and then you win. 
That's Mark. Was that referenced in the book? Ready Player One. Did you read the book? I didn't read the book, but I would not be surprised at all. I think it was. So that might be something that younger people would be exposed to. Adventure (laughs) through that. Literally one-dimensional characters. Yes. (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Vi. This was fun. Thank you guys so much. This was awesome. Yeah, thanks for coming on. This was great. I hope you can use this as some sort of credit for your school. (laughs) I'll do my best. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, listeners. Get more Pretty Much Pop at prettymuchpop.com. Get bonus content for every episode at patreon.com slash prettymuchpop. Pretty Much Pop is part of the Partially Examined Life podcast network, and it's also presented by openculture.com.